Well, this is the last week of our message series that we've been calling Gracious Living. It's about living with God's grace, which, as we've said, is a gift of love from God. Grace is God's favor and love poured out on us. As we've also said, grace helps us in a lot of ways in our lives. It, it reveals the truth about God and how much he loves us. Grace heals us from our sins and helps us turn back to God when we've turned our back on him. And grace throughout our lives, if we're open to it, elevates us, elevates us above our fallen human nature, above our pettiness and our sinfulness and helps us to become better people. And if there's one takeaway that I want you to have from this series, if there's one thing and only one thing you remember, please let it be this. Grace makes life easier. Grace has the power to lighten our burdens. Grace has the power to lessen our concerns. Grace has the power to calm our anxieties and fears. It has the power to help us grow in friendship with God and inspire us towards goodness and virtue to become the people we were made to be. Grace is a relief. It's a relief from the constant demands and expectations of a world that insists that we prove our worth and justify our existence. Because of grace, we are enough. We're enough. Living by God's grace is fundamentally about acceptance. It is about being a gracious recipient of the gift of grace. We do not take grace. We do not earn grace. We receive grace. Grace is given to us in every sacrament. And as Catholics we say that we receive the sacraments. We don't take the sacrament because we receive the grace in there. And grace is given to us in every moment also when we humbly ask God to pour out his grace on us. Just by being here tonight, you are telling God you want to receive and are thankful for his grace. Grace fundamentally is about giving up control. You know, one of my dearest friends is our volunteer ministry leader over small groups and ministries. You probably know her. Uh, She is sometimes a lector here, sometimes has spoken with me after Mass here when we do our little pastor chat occasionally. Her name is Michaela. And I want you to know that I adore Michaela. But I have to tell you... (laughs) That every time I get in the car with her when she's driving, I instinctively start humming that Carrie Underwood song, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. (laughs) Jesus, please take the wheel from this lovely woman because she's scaring me to death right now. I think it's the Italian in her. Anyway, it's actually a helpful phrase, Jesus, take the wheel a helpful phrase throughout life because the truth is we cannot heal ourselves. We cannot raise ourselves up out of the burden of sin. We cannot fully know God and have friendship with God without grace. We have to surrender to that grace and give up control to God. Now today, I want to talk with you about the last act of grace. It is grace that saves us. You know, at some point, we all know that there will be a final curtain call for every one of us. Some years ago, I actually purchased a gravesite at Holy Cross Cemetery down in Colma, which is just south of San Francisco, if you don't know it. Holy Cross Cemetery is the Catholic cemetery of the Archdiocese, and in there, there's a a section where priests are buried, and you'll see on the screen that in that section, there's a tableau of the Lord's Supper and all the priests grave sites are arranged in a semicircle around that tableau. Well I decided that I was going to 
get ready early and buy myself a gravesite so I didn't have to scramble at the last minute whenever that was. And I like the plot. It's beautiful. I've gone to visit it a couple of times. And um, the only problem is that some inconsiderate priest right in front of me who died decades earlier erected a huge Celtic cross. You can see it on the left-hand side of that picture there. And he is going to block my view of the tableau of the Last Supper for all eternity. And he and I are going to have words when I get to heaven. But be that as it may, having that gravesite and paying a little bit every month for it when the bill comes makes me think about death. There will be a time for all of us to move on from this life to the next. And death is the ultimate act of giving up control. But grace has the power to save us. In the gospel today, everyone in that small village of Bethany knew that Lazarus was dead. It had already been four days. Lazarus was not coming back. There was nothing he could do to bring himself back. He had been long buried. The heavy stone rolled in front of the tomb. Even his two sisters had all but given up hope when Jesus had not arrived in time to save him. When Jesus finally shows up on the outskirts of Bethany, Martha runs out to meet him and rebukes him. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Don't you love that? It's a classic move, right? Blame him for not coming sooner, and then in the next breath, ask him for his help. Anyway, Jesus calmly replies, Martha, calm down. Your brother will rise. And she says to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Now, many Jews at that time, including the Pharisees, believed that there would be a day when God would raise up just and righteous people from the dead to live with God forever. But it would be sometime in the future, and everybody would be raised up together. And it wasn't really a fully formed understanding. So Jesus wanted to bring Martha Martha to a deeper understanding of faith. So he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And the life that Jesus will give to Lazarus is the same gift he gave to the woman at the well And the same gift that he gave to the man born blind last week. It is the gift of life-giving grace. Jesus then asks her a very pointed question. Do you believe this? And she responds, yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And I believe that the Lord puts this question to every single one of us every day and at the end of our lives. Do you believe this? Well, the mood suddenly shifts in the story and Jesus becomes perturbed and deeply troubled and they take him to the grave. And in the shortest verse in the entire gospel, Jesus wept. Think about that. Jesus, the Son of God, the one who created everything, the all-powerful one, wept over the loss of his friend Lazarus. He wept over the grief and pain that Martha and her sister Mary felt. He wept over the tragedy and the heartbreak and the outrage of death itself. He was deeply troubled over the loss. And the word perturbed, You know, it sounds like, when I read it in English, perturbed sounds like he was mildly annoyed. (laughs) But that's not what's going on. Because that word is translated from a Greek word that suggests deep emotion and even anger. Jesus wept, yes, but he was also angry. He was angry because death involves suffering. 
Like a parent who sees their child in pain, God feels it even more acutely than we do. Jesus is outraged. He is indignant at the evil of death that was never intended by God from the beginning. This is his reaction to the death of a loved one. And it is so beautiful. Because when you think about it, it is the embodiment of God's compassion for the human condition and the inevitability of death. You know, a lot of people don't believe in God or struggle to believe because God allows suffering and allows the ultimate tragedy of death. And therefore, it seems that he doesn't care about us. You see that in the gospel when some of the people there say, well, if he could heal the man born blind, why didn't he do something so that this man wouldn't have to die in the first place? People ask that all the time. Why does God allow it? But God is not a callous and uncaring God. The point of the story is that Jesus has come to confront an enemy that he will ultimately overthrow on the cross. He has come to confront the greatest fear and the deepest dread of every human being. And death will not have the victory. Death will not be triumphant. Death will be swallowed up in the victory of Christ. And so Jesus said, take away the stone. And so Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. She's like, Jesus, it's going to be stinky. <laughs> she still didn't understand. And so he said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And I love re every time this comes up in the readings, I get chills when I read it because Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. And he was bound, you know, with all these burial bands and had a cloth over his face. So Jesus said to him in words that I also find deeply moving, untie him and let him go. See, Lazarus could not save himself. He was bound by the burial cloths. Someone else had to untie them. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can believe with confidence that our final destiny can be heaven. But eternal life is not something we can achieve on our own. Ultimately, it is grace that allows us to have it. Grace that heals us of our pettiness and weakness. Grace that works with us throughout our whole lives to make us better people. Grace that makes our souls ready to meet God one day. And in that final moment when we close our eyes for the last time, it will be grace that carries us home. There's an artist named Charlie Mackesy. You can see him up there on the screen. He wrote a book a few years ago, and I'm told that every parent, almost every parent, knows and loves this book. It's called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. It became a New York Times number one bestseller for a very long time, and it went on to earn numerous awards. And the author, Charlie, is also a follower of Jesus, and he talks about grace. He talks about grace in this way. He says that grace, that religion, is often presented as a somewhat impossible task. Can we have a picture of the mouse? Charlie drew this picture of the mouse, or he colored in the lines, and he said that sometimes religion feels like we have to pick the perfect colors and co then color in the lines very carefully every day. And if we do that, if we do that, then we will be loved. Like that. If we do that every day and color in the lines perfectly, then we are loved. But the dilemma is that deep down on the inside, I look more like this picture. Coming up. <laughs> kind of messy. Kind of messy. Even on my day, best days, I'm kind of a mess. You can ask my staff. You can ask Michaela. <laughs> I judge people. 
I can be impatient. I get jealous. And maybe you're a little like that too underneath it all. But the good news is that we are loved in our mess like that. God, the artist who created everything beautiful and good in our world, including us, never marks us down for being messy, only for not trying. We are loved in our mess. In fact, we are loved so much that grace works to help us clean up that mess, and we have to do our part. We have to try. And when our small attempts to do the right thing end up going astray, it is grace that makes it right. Grace turns our feeble efforts into a powerful force for good. No matter how half-hearted or weak or ineffective our attempts to love turn out to be, grace makes them stronger in the end. Grace makes our work in this world worthy and crowns it with goodness. This is why our faith says that we can merit heaven. Catholics get a lot of criticism for that because it sounds like we're saying we can earn our way into heaven by doing a lot of work. But that's really not what's going on. God calls us to try and clean up our mess and help others clean up their mess. But it's God's grace that makes it good. It's God's grace that makes everything we try to do meritorious. You know, thinking about all these pictures and everything, I went over to our school last week to talk with the art teacher. And I asked her whether students had to color in the lines to make a good grade in her class, and she actually laughed at me. She said, absolutely not. It would stifle their ability to create. In fact, at some point in their development, the lines, she said, are removed. They don't, they don't get lines anymore. That's kindergarten stuff. Instead, she gives her students a model to follow, and recently that model was Van Gogh's Starry Night that you see on the screen there. It's painted in 1889 during his year-long stay at a mental hospital, and it's considered his masterpiece. And keep it up there for just a minute, please. Uh, it, when you look at that picture, you'll see a town in the bottom there, and it's got very rigid lines if you look at it. And then above it, the stars, the clouds, and the moon are softer. They're more ethereal. They seem to represent heaven. And then that prominent cypress tree that's on the left-hand side of the painting, it's often seen by art connoisseurs as a bridge between life, which is represented by the town, and death, which is represented by the sky, commonly associated with heaven. Okay, you can take it down now. And the fifth grade students in the art class were asked to draw that painting as best as they could and to write some of their fears on the cypress tree. And they weren't given um, uh, lines to draw in. They weren't given paint by numbers. They had to do it on their own. And here's an example of one student's work. It's quite good. You can see that this student's fears are death and loneliness and needles. <laughs> Here's another example. It's harder to see the fears, but they're the same. Loneliness, being alone, losing loved ones, dying yourself. Personally, I think Van Gogh would be inspired by these pictures. In kindergarten, these same students probably had trouble coloring in the lines, but as they grew, they were more and more able to color within the lines and ultimately even create masterpieces of their own. Here's my point. It's the same with grace. In the portraits of our lives, we often make messes, we scribble on the page, we paint with odd colors, we miss the mark. And sometimes it's tempting to throw out the canvas and start over, it's so bad. But our job is to keep coloring, to keep coloring. And if we do that, grace will show God's love to us. Grace will heal our fears, elevate us above our failings, and help to create a holy and beautiful masterpiece that God imagined when he created you. And when we die one day, that masterpiece 
which took a lifetime to create and was the product of our consistent effort and God's never-ending grace, that masterpiece will be hung on the walls in the halls of heaven.